Hello, I'm Paul Challenger, and today I'll be giving an il illustrated talk about what the Mabinogi means to me, having read Wilson and Blackett and Emmanuel Velikovsky books, and having seen Ross Broadstock's videos and various posts on Britain's hidden history and the ancient Kentucky Facebook group pages. I don't mean for this talk to be the most detailed historically accurate or for it to be of textbook quality. Rather, it is an overview and food for thought. The Mabinogi, are they fairy tale stories for children or a record of interplanetary collisions and near misses in the solar system? Or are they observations from a pre-Ice Age advanced civilization or a warning from those who witnessed actual comet or asteroid devastations in the post-world flood era? What is the Mabinogi? Well, here's what Cymru Online have to say in an interview with Professor Seanid Davis of Cardiff University. The authors of the stories are unknown, having been passed down from generation to generation through the oral tradition. Immortalised in writing in the Middle Welsh language and preserved in the White Book of Rhydych, 1300 to 1325 AD, and the Red Book of Hergest, 1375, 1425. The tales concern the trials and tribulations of various Cumric royal families, the Roman Emperor, plagues, romance, voyages, mythical beasts, white horses, and one of the earliest origins of the Arthurian legend. In the 1800s, Charlotte Guest from Lincolnshire, who married the owner of Dowlais Ironworks, translated the stories into English for the first time. She had collected the 11 tales and gave them the title Mabinogion, which was mistakenly believed to be the plural for Mabinogi, a loose translation of which being Tale of a Hero's Boyhood. Speaking about the origin of the collection, Professor Davis said, the title of the Mabinogion implies there is one author and one date, but they are all by different authors and different periods in themselves. The four branches contain resonances of Celtic mythology, like shape-shifting, and white horses, and resonances with the wider world. They're all very different tales. Some are pseudo-historical. There's the dream of Max and Ledig, who was a Roman emperor. It's difficult to date the 11 stories, but they are believed to be from around the Middle Ages. And of course, we'd um, uh, debate with Professor Davis about anybody being Celtic on these islands. But capitalizing on the Mabinogion's new life as stories for children, Pontypridd Town Council have created the Mab Trail from Anisanharad Park, snaking up the hill to the rocking stone on Pontypridd Common. The main rocking stone has been there for a very long time, but more stones have been added in the revival of Druidism, stones laid out in circles and also creating a serpentine form by such people as Edward Williams and William Price. Edward Williams, known as Yolo Morgano, as him on the right, has probably done the most to save Cumbric history. In his enormous compilation book, accused of forging material, but then he's accused by the same people who would destroy the history. 
he is credited with saving so much of the oral histories and old manuscripts. Dr. William Price practiced Druidism as he envisioned it. On the common and in a cellar at Crochet's house, which is now used by the university in Tree Forest. If you pop into their Crochet's cafe, you can be directed to a room just in the reception to the right, which has a glass covered hole in the floor to look down into the cellar room where Dr. Price practiced. Dr. Price is also famous for being the instigator of legalizing cremations in the UK. The authorities took him to court when he cremated the body of his deceased baby son only to find that there was no law prohibiting what he had done. So the Mabinogi came from Bardic oral tradition and Bardism was the student level of Druidism. Bards wrote poetry and sang songs and memorized and told stories. So what did Druidism teach? A full description can be found in the King Arthur Conspiracy, Volume 1, recently republished by Camroglyphics. Druids believed in the transmutation of the soul from the most basic life forms, ever increasing upwards through to an angelic realm. That's another form of reincarnation. They believed in quantum physics and were stargazers, having a one God whose abode was in the sun. Here we see a board game as mentioned in the dream of Ranabui, one of the Mabinogi stories, where King Arthur II is said to have played the game up on Senghenedh Common, soon after the Battle of Baden. The point is, that the game is all about star knowledge, as above, so below. And there's no mistake about the location, as recent research has found by BHH members, that the area mentioned is where a star map training layout has been set, has actually set into the landscape, a landscape that is likely to be destroyed if a wind farm is erected there. This version of the game can be bought for Cumroglyphics. The first knowledge I had about any of this came from books by Alan Wilson and Barham Blackett, and where they had collaborated with others, such as Adrian Gilbert. Much attention has been put on the Mabinogi in their book, Discovery of the Ark of the Covenant. It's a bit of an animal with long sections of the translated stories written out. For two pounds, you can get a sense of the book from Cumroglyphics by downloading Branwen and the Flood, as this is chapter seven of the book, The Discovery of the Ark of the Covenant. The bottom line is that Wilson and Blackett say that the Mabinogi are stories that are ones remembered in a form of code. By the time they were written down, they had been placed in two situations relevant to recognizable times. For example, actual places in Britain, actual events in the lives of real royalty, etc. But if they had been written down in the 1300s, they were 800 or so years later than Arthur II at the Battle of Baden. Behind and written within each tale is a story of solar observation. But who made the observations? Here's an example of code from Branwen and the Flood. Whilst Bran and his brothers were sitting at Harvlech, 
towering stone, they saw 13 ships coming from the south of the weather. And IWO means that extreme, and R means impulse forward, or for the sake of, and on means what is superior, or what is in continuity. Generally, Ewerthon has become simply Erin of Ireland. But here we have 13 ships, being the 13 lunar months of the year, which are coming forward for the sake of superiority continuity, which is most likely that which is moving progressive. The moon controls the ocean tides as it progresses through its lunar months. And there we have one Welsh word, Iwedon, being a triangulated word made up of three parts so that it keeps its meaning intact. And here's an example of how star knowledge started to unravel true history. Wilson and Blackett found that the star map training layout, the Polaris stone and grooves which had marks on them in the landscape up on Sengenith Common, and that's actually Eglisillin Common on the maps. They used these markers on the grooves with the Polaris stone to triangulate where another star's mound or tump should be again as above so below and hey presto when they looked on a map for where regulus the main star in leo should be the location was near anisabul leo the lion being the symbol of the israelites when they were there at anisabul they found in a glow the original name for the village was Anistabil, and that can mean enclosure of the ark. And in that tump that we see in that photograph, Wilson and Blackett believe the ark brought from Palestine with the migrations, a box that holds the Ten Commandments of Moses, has been safely buried in a purpose built chamber a chamber with drainage outlets, some of which Wilson and Blackett found, and some on the other side. Our very own Ross Broadstock and Bob Morgan and others found on a field trip, which can be seen on the Britain's Hidden History Ross YouTube channel. A video of their findings. Incidentally, when I was uh, taking that photograph, there's a rock that I had my friend stand on to point to Tina Glow. When I looked at the side of the rock, I noticed there was a carved marking and it exactly fitted the curvature of Tina Glow. And it also had a little carving out of it, which when you've run your fingers through, the, the outline of Tina Glow was an inch deep and the depression in the center was about two inches square, two inches uh, in the, the square directions on the face and in depth. For the electrified modern world, people could see the stars easily. And they spent time stargazing. Graham Hancock, investigative journalist, has a new TV series running on Netflix called Ancient Apocalypse, in which he is making a case of there having been a very advanced civilization on Earth before the last Ice Age, which was about 10,000 years ago. Civilized society is only supposed to have started 8,000 years or so ago in Mesopotamia with a sudden development of farming. So, obviously, Hancock's work is at odds with the orthodox view. In his series, he filmed on Malta, and a local archaeologist filmed with him 
who said there were 19 megalithic temples on Malta and nearby islands where the direction of the entrance was random, as opposed to aligning to a solstice or any one star. However, when they ran a computer program to see if there was any common star to which each temple entrance pointed, they found that they all pointed towards Sirius, the dog star, the brightest in the night sky, except the entrances only aligned to this one star across very long periods, all of which occurred between 11,000 and 6,000 years ago, 6,000 being when Malta was supposed to have become inhabited by people who boated over from Sicily. The dating of the first and smallest temple to 11,000 years ago arises from the alignment to Sirius. A new temple needed to be built every so many hundreds of years and its entrance realigned to Sirius because of Earth's processional movement, its wobble caused by the planet bellying at the equator due to gravity. The worship of Sirius ties in with ancient Egyptians who worshiped Horus and Isis godlike humans who appeared after the great world flood and taught stoneworking, farming, mathematics, astronomy, and gave civilization laws. Isis stayed in Egypt to rule while Horus then traveled the earth to civilized people elsewhere. And that ties in with countless other societies having the same sort of record of the traveler who gave civilization, brought them things. We think of the solar system as having existed in the same number of planets and orbits as when they were created. But the Mabinogi has encoded the observations by intelligent humans in its stories, which contradicts this view. Where the Red Knight does this or that, and the yellow knight does something else. In response, or gods clash and fight, sometimes destroying each other. Wilson and Blackett state, these are the codes for planetary orbital movement with, say, the red knight being the planet Mars and the yellow knight, Venus. In this way, observation of solar system activity was recorded. Planets were known as wandering stars and were also named as gods. And as the gravitational effects of altering orbits caused massive effects on Earth, power was attributed to the god causing any consequent catastrophe. And this all points eventually to one supreme power being located within or attrib attributed as one omnipotent God. The encoded stories even describe two unknown planets, unknown to, to us, that is, colliding and causing the debris of the asteroid belts in the solar system. One was described as having red in its color, in the Mabinogi and Wilson and Blackett say that one of the asteroid belts contains much red rock. This is at odds with the astrologists who say the asteroid belt is the building blocks of a future planet as opposed to the opposite of the human observation. Clearly, if two planets colliding had been observed by humanity, it had occurred in great antiquity. Comets and asteroids were also observed and were recorded. Some had regular traverses across the night sky and some came close to Earth, very close. They had a massive impact across the globe and all ancient cultures recorded their existence. Dragons, and serpents 
represented them artistically. Meteor showers also occurred. Here's a woodcut picture of an event occurring all across America on 12th of November, 1833. It's a pity they didn't have cameras that way back. Here's another woodcut drawing depicting a comet. Described as the Comet of 532 AD, which devastated Britain. But 532, according to dendrochronologists, i.e. before the Battle of Baden, which was circa 551, where no mention is made of a comet at that time in the Welsh Triads. But the date Britain was devastated is given as 562 by Wilson and Blackett. Here's a model made by one of the BHH group of St. Peter's Church upon Minna the Gaia. Churches built in Britain prior to 562 pointed due east at the time of building. So that would be the small part on the very far right of the model if that had been built prior. But subsequent expansion, which would be to the left of the surviving building, saw the new larger church building also point you east, but there is a degree or so of changed angle. The degree shift made the northern coast of Africa at the Mediterranean infertile, and numerous cities there were abandoned. Either the comet or Earth's precession appear to have altered the degree of tilt of the Earth by just over the degree. If this was processional, it reflects that church building has been going on for a very long time on these isles. The early British harbour at Cardiff, rediscovered by the Victorians, who promptly built over the discovery, sank into the sea, hence the need for the fleet which sailed to America, having to sail from Milford Haven. This could mean the degree of shift occurred because of the comet and not precession. This stone was found 28 feet down when Victorians excavated near St. Paul's Cathedral in London. The stone was palmed off as being Scandinavian, right in the heart of Britain. As the writing was labelled, as being runic. Writing is on the side there to the left. However, Wilson and Blackett translated the writing on the sides saying it is British Coilbra and that the carving shows a contemporaneous image of the 562 comet. It's no wonder that a dragon features on the Welsh flag. 562 event would have been sufficient to turn a memory into the national psyche. Or, as serpent snake worshippers, the comet memory may have just as easily come with the migrations from Assyria. Wilson and Blackett often quote Immanuel Velikovsky's books. If the Israelites were not slaves, as many people think, what could have prompted them to leave Egypt? In his Worlds in Collision, Velikovsky has the surviving enslaved Israelites leave because of a catastrophe, as a term twister, because of a catastrophe inflicted on the planet. And here's the catastrophe described in his worlds in collision, the darkness. The earth entered deeper into the tail of the encrusted, onrushing comet and approached its body. This approach, if one is to believe the sources, was followed by a disturbance in the rotation of the earth. Terrific hurricanes swept the earth as of the change or reversal of the angular velocity of rotation. 
and because of the sweeping gases, dust and cinders of the comic. Numerous rabbinical sources describe the calamity of darkness. Darkness was of such kind that their eyes were blinded by it and their breath choked. It was not of ordinary earthly kind. If the Egyptian darkness was caused by the Earth's stasis or tilting of its axis and was aggravated by a thin cinder dust from the comet, then the entire globe must have suffered from the effect of the two concurring phenomena. In either the eastern or the western parts of the world, there must have been a very extended gloomy period. Nations and tribes in many places on the globe, to the north, south, west of Egypt, all have traditions about a cosmic catastrophe during which the sun did not shine. But in some parts of the world, the traditions maintain that the sun did not set for a period of time equal to a number of days. And it goes on on to the next chapter of earthquake. The earth forced out of its regular motion reacted to the close approach of the body of the comet. A major shock convulsed the lithosphere and the earth quake was across the entire globe. Ipua, an Egyptian, witnessed and survived this earthquake. The towns are destroyed. Upper Egypt has become waste. All is ruin. So you get the flavour of um, what Emmanuel Velikovsky is describing. He later describes the, another of the plagues that are in Exodus in the Bible, inflicted on the Egyptians. And that one is clearly described as earthquakes. More of the Israelites surviving, because they have, may have lived in dwellings made of wattle and daub, as opposed to clay brick. The name for the migration to modern day Tuscany is derived from those of the 10 tribes of, of the Cymri, the 10 lost tribes of Israel. From memory of reading the King Arthur Conspiracy, volume one, I think it came from Uterez, meaning the tent people or the traveling people, which became Etruscan, and that be, then became Tuscany in the modern world. If they dwelt in tents whilst in Egypt, in Egypt, they would have had a better chance of surviving an earthquake. And in fact, after earthquakes in the modern time, people rush out to the fields and live in tented cities, don't they? Velikovsky thought from his reading of rabbinical sources that 45 out of every 50 of the, of the 12 tribes of Israel in Egypt perished. That's a lot of people. The recently published book, Artemis Child on the East Coast of the Peloponnese, and that's been highlighted on the Ancient Kentucky Facebook group page, appears to prove that the Exodus was instigated by an enormous caldera style volcanic eruption, the type that upon eruption, the volcano's middle collapses in on itself. Here's detail from the extract. Modern geologists believe that Santorini's volcano had exploded with the energy of several hundred atomic bombs in a fraction of a second, and that the Thera or Santorini volcanic eruption had been one of the biggest volcanic events in human history. Velikovsky draws upon ancient records from many cultures worldwide. Reference to them is in the footnotes on almost every page of his books. For example, much of his information on the Exodus comes from Jewish rabbinical sources. Clearly, there have been huge changes on the face of the planet across millennia. 
Orthodox science says the orbits of the planets in the solar system are set in their regular patterns. So if humans observed planets colliding or having different orbits to now, those observations must have been made in great antiquity. Plato received his information about Atlantis from Egyptian priests who said to him that the flood, the world flood, occurred 9,000 years before. Have the migrating Cymri, the 10 lost tribes of Israel, who were once in Egypt, brought ancient pre-flood knowledge with them and recorded it orally and then eventually in the written Mabinogi. Food for thought. Modern science is aware of the potential destructive power of an asteroid impact and astronomers have discovered a huge and previously unknown object entering our solar system that will reach the orbit of Saturn in 2031. It is possibly the largest body from the outer reaches of our solar system ever found to make such a close approach to the sun. And remember the Mabinogi warns of things in the solar system affecting the gravitation, gravitational traverse of the solar system by other planets, not just Earth. So this asteroid is known as 2014 UN271. It is estimated to be between 100 and 370 kilometers across, spotted by the Dark Energy Survey. That is one big lump of rock. And I found that information in the New Scientist magazine, Space 21 of June 2021, in an article written by Jonathan O'Callaghan. A final word by Professor Davis of Cardiff University, speaking about the Mabinogion's enduring appeal. Professor Davis said, they are fascinating stories. I have lectured in universities for 40 years, and every year you would find different things, or a student would ask a question you had never thought of before. People can find things in the stories which are relevant today. There are even three plagues mentioned in the story, which is extremely relevant. I think I translated them as plagues, but they can also be seen as oppressions. The tales talk about people's fears and how they overcome them. There's something new in all of them. The Arthurian ones have been very popular over the years. They are all very different and make us think about different things. Well, Ross used to say that Wilson and Blackett found the true British history hanging by its fingertips on the edge of a cliff and that their research dragged it up onto its elbows. Maybe you can't compare the fight to defeat Nazism with the fight to preserve true history. But if you can take poet poetic license to do so, I'd like to paraphrase Winston Churchill by saying, so much is owed by so many to so few. Now videos are available on Britain's Hidden History YouTube channel on the Mabinogi Trail at Pontypridd, on Sengherith Common, Eglisillan Common, a possible Serpent Temple at Tarandysant, that's near Baitha, on Tina Glow, and other mounds in the area, on Finding the Lion Stone, and much more. Ross had a prolific work rate from all of us. Thanks, Ross. Books mentioned in this uh, talk and the board game Gwydbwch 
are available from www.camroglyphics. Thank you very much for watching and for listening.